everybody. My name is Ann Alton. I'm a physical therapist here at Illinois Regional Pain Institute. Um, thank you all for coming. Wow, it's a good turnout. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk today about neuropathy. Um, who who knows somebody with neuropathy or has it themselves? Me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's a pretty it's a it's a pretty common. Uh, condition to have. Uh, as we'll find out later, there are lots of things that can cause it. Um, and so some of the treatments are based on what causes it, but then there's some things that you can do to kind of help mitigate and help uh, to even, re you know, uh, hopefully bring it back, dial it back a little bit too, okay? Um, so just a quick re refresher on your nervous system. If you all remember back to what was it, fourth or fifth grade, we learned all this stuff. <laughs> Um, so what I have here is a picture of a nerve, okay, all right, um, you have the, th there is actually one end of the nerve is where all of, most of your sensors are, okay. We have different types of receptors that are there to pick up different types of information. So some of them are mechanical, which is about pressure, soft touch, anything that's kind of touch related. Um, you have chemical receptors that are there just to notify you of chemical changes in the tissues. So that can be an inflammation process, okay? Um, and then there's also thermal, which is there to tell you about any changes in temperature, okay? There are, I don't know how many different types of receptors amongst those three basic categories. There's like, I don't know, hundreds, okay? So there are lots of different types. Once something gets by that nerve, so there's, this is an all or nothing proposition here, okay? Either it's switched on or it's off, okay? So you can have very, very, barely lightest touch and the nerve won't fire, or you can go just a little bit deeper and then it's on, but there's no in between, there's no half, okay? All right. Um, once that goes, once that nerve picks up a signal, it sends it on down what we call the axon. Some of our axons are sheathed in what's known as myelin sheath, which is kind of an insulator, okay? Some of them are not, okay? And then we can talk a little bit later, sometimes damage can happen to that myelin sheath and that can cause some issues there, okay? Anywhere there is not myelin sheath, the body can put in extra what we call ion channels, which is just another word for a receptor, okay? So any time the receptor is what picks up changes in the, in the, in the body situation. Any time we have an injury or possible damage to the system or danger in an area, the body can put in extra receptors, Oh yeah. okay? There's, that's bad news in that you become extra sensitive to, to any of those uh, particular inputs, okay? The good news is they only last 48 hours, okay? Then the body's gonna take them down and put up new ones. If we can manage to convince the body that it doesn't need that extra receptor, the body will take it down and not put another one up, okay? So it's very changeable, all right? The trick is, how do we get the body to go, oh, I don't need that anymore. That's the hard part, okay? Makes, all right. But the good news is that they can't change, okay? All right, so once it goes all the way up to the, to the other end, okay, sometimes this happens in the spinal cord and sometimes this will happen in the brain. It depends on a different kind, you know, the different pathways uh, that different nerves take, okay? Uh, once it gets to the end, it has to pass on that information somehow. And how it does that is with, with what we call neurotransmitters. Um, are you guys familiar with that term at all? You've heard of us talking about, probably heard of GABA, or you may take gabapentin, which helps to calm that section of, of down a little, okay? Yeah. Helps it not pass on the message quite as easily, okay? Um, and then there's like serotonin, there's acetylcholine, there's a lot of different neurotransmitters, and that's gonna come in to be important in a little bit. Okay, um, but our body has to make these neurotransmitters to pick up the signal from the old nerve and send it on to the next one. And I don't mean old by, I mean like old as in just being used, done. 
That is an, an actual H, okay. All right, so the, from the previous nerve to the next nerve. Okay, um, so that's, that's a basic of the nervous, of the, the peripheral nervous system or the nervous system that's out here in, um, in your body, okay? This gets taken to the spinal cord and then on up to the brain, okay? Um, at this point, all we have is type of information, like mechanical, thermal, like temperature, or chemical, and where. That's all we have right at the moment. Okay, once it gets to your spinal cord, we only know what it is and where it is, okay? Once it gets to your brain, okay, now we have, the brain has to say, okay, what do we know about the situation? Okay, are we running from a burning house? Have we done this before? What's all going on with this, with this information? Because the, the brain only gets what it is and where it is, okay? And they actually come in, in different speeds. So if you've ever stubbed your toe and you go, ah, and then, ah, I know. Right? Okay, yeah. so that's, that's two different nerves firing at the same time, okay? They get the inf information. Part of it goes to your spinal cord and says, draw your foot back, this is a bad thing. And then the rest of it can go to the brain. It takes about, um, it goes the whole length of your body in about a second. Uh -huh. It's that split second later that you start to actually feel it, and then now you're, you're in pain, okay? All right, so that, those are, are some of the different um, types of nerves there, too. So the brain then has to decide, is this something I need to pay attention to? Okay. Um, has anybody ever gotten undressed one night and find a bruise? Yeah. And don't know where it came from? Okay. I've gotten asked about this I don't know how many times. I have no clue. No clue at all what happened there. Okay, the nerves had to have fired, right? Yeah. There's there's I, tissue damage. They were my brain was like, oh my god, that klutz. She does this all the time. It's nothing we have to worry about. I didn't feel the pain. I didn't feel anything. Okay, when that happened. So the brain has a really big part of deciding whether something is important is is important enough to do something about. Okay. So what you're saying is that your brain has memory. It does. For that. Yes, it does. Thing. It surely does. And so, if you know that the last time you messed up your back, you lost your job, you lost a bunch of friends, now your social life is nil, you can't work anymore, you're struggling financially, your relationship's in trouble, you move your back in a similar way, your brain's going to go, holy cow, man, this is a really big deal. You don't want to be doing this anymore. Okay? The other example that I have that's like this that doesn't have anything to do with pain at all is, and I, I won't ask for a show of hands here, but many of us have had the experience of either drinking something to excess or eating something that was, um, you know, had, had some food poisoning salmonella or something in it, right? Okay? And then you're very sick. And the next time somebody comes up to you with that food or your drink and you smell it and your gut is like, oh, no way. No way, you are not eating that ever again. Okay, I feel that way about popcorn. <laughs> and, and wine coolers, too. <laughs> so, so it, it's, it's, you know, your, your brain, the survival part of your brain is, is a wonderful thing in that it is designed to remember all of these things for you so you don't have to consciously check in every single whip stitch for ev of every part of your day. Okay. All right, so that's the basic overview of your whole nervous system. Um, today we're talking about neuropathy, which typically takes place in the peripheral nervous system. Um, there are lots of things that you can do that work with the brain and the spinal cord, but today we're going to talk a little bit more about what happens in the, in the peripheral nervous system. Okay. One thing that I would like you to think about, and it, for sake of ease, we separate it out to talk about it in terms of the peripheral nervous system and then the central nervous system. But in actuality, it's kind of one giant squid. It's one nerve, it's one organ, essentially, okay? So it's, the brain has little feelers that come all the way out, okay? So really, when I'm doing massage on your foot, I'm in your brain, okay? Kind of creepy, but it is what it is, all right? <laughs> anyway, okay, so what do we need um, for health? in the nervous system. You need good nutrition, 
okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a little bit, but um, you need sugar, oxygen, and you need uh, basics like vitamin B, vitamin D, um, other minerals, zinc, all of those things. So you need those things in order to maintain the health of the nerve, in order to maintain the health of the, of the surroundings of the nerve, um, and also to feed the nerve itself, the sugar and the oxygen. You need blood flow to get the nutrition where it needs to go and to take away any waste products that may have been made, okay? No matter what, we're always making waste product. Um, no matter any time you use energy, any time a nerve fires, any time a muscle fires, we're always using energy and the result of that energy is waste product. So you have to have the blood flow in order to take that away. And what we see a lot of times in the clinic is um, that people have been, they haven't moved for so long, their skin is like an elephant skin almost in different areas, especially real, real painful areas. That's a backup of waste product, essentially. So we work on trying to get those tissues to kind of soften and get that, get those waste products to move on out so that the, the tissues can be healthier, okay? Um, we need movement. In order for the nervous system, you, you, you hear the, the term, you don't use it, you lose it, okay? So the nervous system is the same way. If those nerves are not being uh, used in a correct fashion, if they're not being, if the correct types of, of input aren't being experienced, those things kind of go by the wayside. And the things that you use all the time are going to be better and stronger. Okay. Um, and they also need space. And the space is there for the ability to exchange the nutrients uh, for the waste products. Okay. So we need to have space around the nerves. Okay. And we'll go into a little bit more on how these things apply to different types of uh, issues and different causes of neuropathy right now, actually. Um, okay, so types, causes of neuropathy, one of the really big common one is a metabolic syndrome or diabetes. Okay, typically the problem with, um, with that one is that we're not getting the sugar to the cells. So if you have diabetes, what you're missing is insulin Okay, or you, you know, your insulin isn't working correctly. Okay, insulin is basically the key that fits in the lock to open the door to allow the sugar into the cell. If you don't have that, your cells start to starve. And guess what? Like any starving person, they're gonna scream at you. Okay. Um, another common one is a B12 deficiency. Um, I know a lot of people around here that get B12 shots. Um, and B12 is, okay, who remembers what mitochondria is? Or I should say maybe who doesn't remember what a mitochondria is? Ooh, okay, so this is, yeah, this is way back in, in junior high science. Basically, all of our cells have these little tiny, what we call organelles. One of them is called a mitochondria. And it is responsible for taking the sugar and the fats from your food and converting them into a, a currency that your cells can use, okay? Um, and it's, it's really an amazing process, but I won't bore you with all the details. <laughs> but uh, you know how we wish that we could run our cars on water? The reason we don't is because it's quite an ex explosive proposition, but our bodies do that all the time. It's pretty amazing. We take water, we break it down into H2, er, to, to hydrogen and oxygen, and that, that act is really explosive, but it actually steps it down in a way that it creates, then stores energy in a different way. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really amazing thing. But, so B12 deficiency, B12 is absolutely necessary in order for that mitochondria to do its work. If it can't do its work, you're still starving yourselves. Even if the sugar got into the cell, you're still starving because you can't make it into the thing that you need in order to use it. Um, different medications, chemotherapy, radiation, um, there are a lot of reasons why this can cause uh, neuropathy, but typically um, a big one is again B12 deficiency. These medications can rob your body of the B12. Um, it, can, it, it can also increase um, your inflammation, which when you have increased inflammation in an area, if it, things are not moving as well, you know how swollen it gets and how, how nothing's moving, 
in that arm or that body part, okay, that's restricting the blood flow. It's restricting the exchange of nutrients, oxygen, sugar for waste products and the ability to move those waste products out. So if you have a traffic jam, you ain't getting where you need to go, okay? Uh, again, repetitive stress is another reason why we can have uh, neuropathy. Um, the constant mechanical stress of the same motion over and over and over can cause some inflammation and can cause decreased blood flow to, it, to an area. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it's just kind of the gradual wearing away, but then that inflammation kind of can come up and make it difficult for that exchange of nutrients to happen. Are you getting a theme here? The nerves are starving. <laughs> the nerves are starving. We just have to figure out why and correct that part, right? Okay. Kidney or heart disease. Um, oh, I skipped a bunch. Um, trauma. Uh, trauma can damage the nerve, and, and a lot of times this is, this is one that where we have some pretty significant nerve damage. Um, but also the inflammation can impede the flow as well. Uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, this can attack the myelin sheath. Remember I talked about the myelin sheath earlier and how if we don't have a myelin sheath on some, it's easier for your body to put in extra sensors, extra receptors, okay? So if it's destroying that myelin sheath, sometimes you get extra sensors in that area and that's, those are kind of hard to get the body to, sh to shut down. Um, kidney or heart disease, again, you get a decrease in blood flow. Um, a lot of people are realizing this, but uh, the kidneys and the heart work really, really closely together. Your kidneys uh, tell the heart, because they're so pressure sensitive, your kidneys are so pressure sensitive, it has to be an exact amount of pressure for that filter to work correctly. And the kidneys have pressure sensors to tell the heart, I need less blood flow because I, I, I've got too much backing up, or I need more blood flow because I can't get this filter to work right. Okay, so it tells your heart how hard to beat. Okay, this is why if you have high blood pressure, they will often give you a water pill. Yeah. Okay, because it's making it a little bit easier for your kidneys to work, okay. and that will lower the blood pressure down. Makes some sense. Yeah. So, so the kidneys or heart disease, both kind of in the same kind of general area. If you're not getting the blood pressure to move through the body the way it should, then you're not getting the nutrition that your body needs, okay? Um, also, again, toxins, if people have, uh, you know, if you drink a lot, if you have uh, heavy metal poisoning, some of those kinds of things can also cause neuropathy, okay? And again, so, so the question is, do we, are we sensing a theme here? So the three, the four things that the body, that the, the nervous system needs, nutrition, blood flow, movement and space and so a lot of these things interfere with one of those four yes exactly okay so um you know basically i have like four different four different treatments obviously there are some things that you can do and i, I chose to focus this in a little bit more on what physical therapy can do um, but there are medications that you can take that will help with um, nerve conduction uh, or slowing it down or speeding it up, whatever it is that, that you need. Um, but basically, blood sugar regulation and other nutritional deficits need to be addressed, okay? Um, there are places that you can go, and it's not exactly on the, on the cheap side, so you know, I'm gonna give you a couple of workarounds a little bit. Um, you can get these things tested in your blood. You can get uh, zinc, Tested. You can get CoQ10, which is another uh, enzyme that's really necessary for that mitochondria to be able to convert sugar and fats into usable energy. Um, you can get your vitamin B levels checked. You can get some of these vitamin D levels checked. They're actually starting to do vitamin D levels as a pretty, pretty common, pretty, you know, your yearly exam. They'll often check your vitamin D levels. Um, but you can get the other things checked as well. Um, you, a lot of times you will have to ask for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the workarounds essentially is, you know, you could try a multivitamin. Of course, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist about whether or not they're going to interact with any of the medications that you take. I know that a lot of people are on blood thinners and it's like a big bad no-no to take anything with vitamin K in it. Too. 
Right. So, exactly. So, I mean, you definitely want to check, do your due diligence, and make sure that you're not going to take something that's, that's going to do you harm. Um, there, there are some, you know, issues where people who don't do B vitamins very well that are over the counter in their stable form. And so a lot of times people will recommend that you go ahead and take what's known as the methylated version of vitamin B, just the active form. If you can't remember anything else, just, you know, ask the pharmacist about the active form of vitamin Bs. See if that helps. Okay. You know, it's kind of a trial and error, but you can kind of see it does boosting the nutrition help a lot. Of course, I'm going to also recommend that you try to eat better. But I also know that standing in front of a sink when your feet are killing you, you know, to, to wash your vegetables and chop them up, I know that's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty daunting task. Um, Lindsay and I are working on having some kind of nutritional um, things available, how to do like a, a mason jar salad, which is something that you can kind of make up and they, they do last for about a week if you seal them right, you know. Um, and just kind of some easy, simpler meals that you can do that, that don't take a lot of standing and chopping and, you know. And the other thing that I've noticed is when I go online and I look at a recipe, it says, oh, brown these, then, you know, put these in just until they're this, you know, just until they're soft, and then you add this, and then you add this, and then you, I have a friend who's a chef, I called her up and I said, Caroline, is it absolutely necessary that I follow these directions? She said, no, mm -hmm. just throw it all in the pot. <laughs> you know, it may make a little, if you have an extremely sensitive palate, you may notice a, a difference, but you're at home. You know, just throw it in the pot. And, and Rachel Ray has all that stuff chopped up for her already. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay, I know. Yeah, and she's like, oh, anybody can do this. And I thought, yeah, yeah. okay. Right? <laughs> exactly. There's another chef doing all the chopping. You've got a yes. sous chef under right. you. That's, yeah, that works right. That, that works fine. Um, I do cheat and will buy the stuff that's already chopped up. Um, but I have been known to, you know, pull up a chair and do the chopping at the kitchen table, too. Uh, but anyway, enough about that. That's it. You know, so you just want to make sure that your blood sugar is regulated. Um, a real easy way to do that is cut off the sugar, cut out the white bread, you know, the pastas, because that will make your blood sugar spike, and then that will wear out your insulin, okay? Um, that's simplifying it over much, but basically that's what happens over a period of years when we start to do this thing with our blood sugar. Um, your body really works hard at trying to keep it at, a, at an even level, right. and if you're you're making it work extra hard, that's gonna that's gonna cause some issues. Okay. Uh, sugar is, I will tell you all, I am complete at it. Um, somebody said something to me the other day about never ever eating sugar again, and I freaked out. <laughs> like in my brain, I was like, no. You can't, I can't, I can't ever have sugar again. So I'm like, oh, that's like the hallmark of addiction, right? <laughs> it's when you start to flip when somebody says something about never doing it again. So it's it's a very difficult thing to get off of, and you know, keep keep that in mind that it does light up the same areas of the brain as cocaine does. Yeah. And some pretty yeah. powerful stuff. Um, so, so you're you know. saying cocaine's better for you. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the whole thing being, it, you know, if you try to get off a of sugar and you find it really hard to do, just keep that in mind. Understand that you're fighting an addiction issue, probably. What about the sugar substitutes? Are they in? I don't like sugar. Uh, sugar substitutes are kind of a thorny... Use stevia. Stevia is really, it's a natural plant That's that true. is naturally sweet and is, is, is non-caloric and we have not found any issues with it as yet. For those of you who are considering aspartame, go out and look at a video how it's made and how the gentlemen are dressed that are making it. They're in bunny suits, they got respirators on. If they got to be like that to make this, I would be thinking maybe that's not something you want to administer. That's a good it. point. That's a very good point. Um, so the sugar suits to oh, make yeah. it. Oh yeah. I, that's wild. I have never done that before. I've never seen that. I yeah, it has not big time. That's crazy. Like okay, so the the other thing um, to think about is that they did they've done a bunch of studies about sugar substitutes versus no sugar, or just regular sugar. Um, one of them they had they followed women who drank uh, just one liter 
of diet soda per week versus women that drank one liter of regular soda per week. And the women that drank the diet soda were two and a half times more likely oh, really? to get diabetes. So something is happening in the body with that, because you have, you have sugar taste buds, and they actually go all the way down the esophagus, okay? So something is happening when your body feels that sweet come through, it's responding very similarly. So, um, so even though it's not sugar, it's going, we got sugar. We got sugar. And then right. when, it, when your body goes to look for, my, at least my personal logistic thinking through this process is the body goes, oh, we got sugar. And then when there's no sugar there, okay, now we're going to call for sugar. We're going to, so you get hungry or you start to eat more sugar or sh sweet foods. Okay. Uh, the thing that my sister told me about that really did help me get, I, well, it helped me get off of sugar a couple of times, <laughs> is that if you eat more sweet fruits and vegetables, um, more of the vegetables, like the carrots, onions, beets, sweet potatoes, those sorts of things can help level out blood sugar and keep you from doing this whole cycling. Okay. Okay, what you're saying, we need insulin and water to keep our bodies moving. Yes. But just don't overdo the insulin, the sugars? Correct, right. So the, the sugar, yeah, the sugar, your body is going to take whatever you make and, and, or whatever you eat and convert it into one of three things, okay, or parse it up into one of three things, and that's proteins, fats, or sugars. So you can eat a sweet potato or um, an apple or something like that and it's going to take those ingredients and it's going to separate out the sugars from the proteins from the fats okay the real sweet sugars like the concentrated um, sweets sugar like the white granular sugar mm -hmm. the high fructose corn syrup um, the just regular corn syrup even like maple syrups those kinds of <coughs> things are going to be super easy for your body to, to they go straight into the bloodstream. They don't have to be broken up. Your body has to, doesn't have to do much for it. Okay. So it floods the it floods the bloodstream with the sweet the sugars quickly. Okay, because the body's not having to break it up. It's not having to work at it. Okay, so it just goes, oh cool, we got this, and we dump it into the so that increases your blood sugar, which is gonna call your body to make more insulin. So the okay. insulin is gonna overproduce. It's going to put everything where it needs to go. And, and if you're not using energy on a regular basis, um, so you're not, you're eating a bowl of pasta, but then you're not doing a swimming race the next day, right? Your, your body's going to go, okay, I got all this extra energy. What am I going to do with it? Okay, I'm going to stick it under the mattress for next time, right? In case, <laughs> right? So that's when we start to put on excess weight, is when we're taking in more calories than we're using, um, and more easy calories. Okay. okay. Does, did that answer your question? Uh, I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the main thing is give, it, give your body things that are harder for it to break up so that the stream of energy is slower, so the insulin doesn't spike and crash and spike and crash. Okay, so we've got the blood sugar regulation and the, the nutritional deficits addressed. Um, we're gonna go on to movement. Uh, movement's really important for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the nerves need that movement in order to fire, okay? So what we use, we maintain, right? Um, the other thing is, is that the heart is not really the only pump in your body. You don't have a heart in your big toe to push everything back up. To the to the heart but the muscles in the periphery do a squeezing action on your veins that help to move the fluid from from your legs from lower down in the body back up to the heart okay so movement will help to move the blood through blood flow it will help to move out inflammation okay is that everybody following right okay 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 so so movement is really important it doesn't have to be you know, if you're on the couch 24-7 right now, it doesn't have to be go out and run a 5K tomorrow. It could be just doing the alphabet with your toes. 
okay? It can just be a little bit at a time, and I'm gonna go baby steps, okay? I want baby steps. So if that's, if you're sitting on a couch 24 seven or in bed most of the time, you're gonna start with very, very small movements and you're gonna stop when you get tired, okay? okay. All right, um, breath retraining. This one is huge. Um, we had a patient who, we worked with him for a whole hour on just breathing and he had what, how many hours of, of complete pain relief, he said? A couple of hours at least. A couple of hours of, of the complete day, pain relief. Yeah. From this nine out of 10 out of 10 most every single day, we worked on just breathing for a whole full hour and he got pain relief. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me there's an oxygen thing happening here. There's a problem with the oxygen flow for this guy, okay? And so a lot of times if you can work on taking really super deep breaths, breathing with the belly uh, a couple of times a day, try to do about 10 of them, that can help quite a bit. And so you get a better acclimated to breathing with your belly, okay? Here in this country, we have this thing where we have to suck our guts in, okay? <laughs> if you're in pain, we don't care about that anywhere. None of us are gonna be on America's Next Top Model, right? So we're, <laughs> we're just gonna breathe the way that our body kinda needs to. Um, I will warn you that when I started doing breath retraining at about 10 breaths, I was dizzy. Because <laughs> my brain was like, whoa, what's this stuff? <laughs> what's oxygen? Where did what's come from? Yeah. Uh, so if you choose to do that and you get to just give yourself a minute to kind of before you go up and do the rest of your day. Okay. okay. That's what's good about yoga. We're getting yes. a lot of stress on breathing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This is where yoga really helps. And Between the healthy. movement and the breath retraining, the yoga can really, really help. Mm -hmm. You do want to find a class that's going to start off or an instructor that can help you to to modify whatever poses that right. they're trying to get you in. Um, and tip, really, honestly, yoga, we think about these, these crazy yoga people with the foot up behind their head and, oh, you know, all these kind of stuff. Honestly, it's just about moving and being in your body. Okay? Okay. So yeah. it's, not, it, it's not about attaining any sort of per perfection because everybody's body is different. So mm -hmm. it's about figuring out, you know, what, what works for you, what does this feel like, okay, being in your body. Most of us, when we have chronic pain, we're not in our bodies very much. I'm in chronic pain right. constantly. Yeah, we don't want to be there. It hurts. Holy mind in the garage. Right? <laughs> There's different yeah. kinds of yoga, too. Everybody well, thinks you do that. Yeah, you know, they say, show one on TV, and she runs in with the mat. She does that one. Yeah. Pose, the warrior it one. Yeah. <laughs> Ours, yeah. the one I go to is chair and standing. Thanks. Okay. But we don't get on the floor. Okay. We thought I couldn't get up. Yeah, that's it. So, so yeah. So, so what she's, what she's saying, what she's saying is that there are some yoga classes out there that are almost take place either standing or in a chair. Okay, so it's it's uh, much less impact, and you're not doing the whole downward dog where you got your hands on the floor and your butt's way up behind you, and you're trying to lift a leg. And no, no you know the, there are much less uh, intensive. And you have baby goats running around. Oh, oh yeah, I've heard about this. And I thought, no way. Oh, the baby goats. Because uh -huh. they like they want to want get on top of things, so yeah. they're giving you a little extra to lift. Yes, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Oh. Yeah, well, then there was bunny yoga in Pekin the other a couple of weeks ago. We did yoga with bunnies. Yeah, <coughs> bunnies are kind of scary to me, so I just see what's like in the face. But you know, they're kind of cute for some people. It was like a goat yoga too. Yeah, that's what she was just saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more comment on yoga while you're on it is they do have chair yoga that's modified specifically for people that can't tolerate standing too long or just not moving a lot. So if you look up chair yoga, you can do a lot of the postures from a chair. And they do a lot of modifications in that that are good for a lot of people. Ours, yeah. ours is a combination. Yeah, like half standing the class and chair. is kind of more the chair ones and then right. half the stand legs. See, that's perfect. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Good. And then if you have that chair to hold on to, if you Yes, yeah, she stresses, <laughs> Kelly modifies 
sure that I modify anything that would cause you pain. It's That's good. Pain. So where do you go again? I go out to Humana. Humana, okay. And is that open to the public then too, or do you have to be a Humana subscriber? I don't think everybody's a subscriber. And then Kelly also teaches at Landmark on Wednesdays. Okay. Also. Okay. And that so for uh, certain insurances, it's called silver. Silver sneakers. Silver sneakers. sneakers. That's, that's what mine is. That's silver sneakers. sneakers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's a really great one. It's your insurance pays for it, I guess. That's what I'm told. So yeah. some insurances will. No, I don't, no, I don't pay that. anything. She doesn't. Uh -huh. Yeah, and some insurances will pay for some of those classes. So you can double check yeah. with your insurance yeah. company and see if they'll pay for anything like that. Oh no, I um, think you gotta have AARP. No. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean it depends. There may be AARP may pay for some over here, but not oh, here, okay. and some you know Humana may pay for that one and not that one. I don't know, but you, you have to check with your insurance. Yeah, I think different insurances have it. Um, but that's that's why movement and breath retraining will help. Okay, because right. it'll help restore blood flow to those those tissues, mm -hmm. help move out some of the inflammation. Um, and manual therapy is another um, one that's good. So getting a massage, um, having the physical therapist who's willing to put hands on. Um, that can also help because we're stimulating nerves in a non-threatening way, okay? Um, and then we're also helping to re re uh, what's the word? <laughs> reintroduce blood flow to the area, um, which is so important for, for that. It's working for me. Good. I think that it's helping me too, which I'm, I'm really chronic, so yeah. that's a really good thing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot that can be done, and, and I didn't I didn't add this in, but I was gonna do kind of a another um, what we call as a movement, um, <clears throat> what we call flossing. So um, we're gonna show you a very simple flossing exercise that you can do at home. Um, I don't want any pain with this at all. So we'll modify however we need to modify. Okay. But if you have, um, I'm going to show you a lower body one that's pretty simple that you can do from sitting position, okay? And basically, if you, this is on the idea that, that we have one big long nerve that goes from the tippy top of your head all the way down the back of your back, down to your buttocks, down the back of your butt, down the back of your leg, all the way down the back of your calf, down the back of underneath your foot and down to your toe. Wow. Okay? So this is... One, one or two nerves, single cells, that go all the way down through this area, okay? All right, so in that case, this is as long as it will get, right? Because it's going down the back of my body and I'm making that the longest it can get, right? Right. Okay, so that, that may be a little threatening to look at <laughs> at this point, okay? All I'm gonna ask you to do is kick your leg out till you feel just a teeny little tug and you're gonna bring it back. Okay, all right. If you're not feeling any of that, you can kind of try to slump your back a little. You feeling it, huh? Don't go too I far. It. Yeah, don't go too far. So, so if you, if you, this is what you get. This is what you get. Okay. So this is just all we're trying to do is kind of work that nerve. Okay. And kind of like when you floss your teeth, we're just kind of flossing that nerve a little bit, trying to get a little bit more space around the nerve. To yeah, this leads the me blood to a flow. question for me. Huh? Directly behind you, do you have a part of a vertebrae sitting up there? Yes. Am I correct in assuming that those little things passing through that hole are nerves? Yes. Okay. So we want those to be able to move. Yes. Now is it true? I've told I've been told that when that disc wears out, there's still enough passage for that nerve. Yes. So this 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 hole, this is where one of the one of the nerves that passes so out. we are flossing that. We're literally trying to get that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I just broke a whole new bunch of information loose in my head. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So so even if this disc were to go away completely, okay, we still would have plenty of room here. Okay. <coughs> even if you were to have some bone spurs around, you still have See? plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Okay. However. The problem becomes um, when, okay, so this is the, the hole and this is the nerve, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we decrease the space by half. What happens when we inflame the nerve? Okay, now we have a problem. Is that with okay. the infusion or not? What, they like the, the epidural? Spinal infusion, epidural. Yeah, I mean. yeah, the epidural. The epidural's aim is to get the swelling to come down so that you can restore movement safely, 
okay, without irritating that nerve again and perpetuating that, that biofeedback cycle that's going on between your brain and your, and your nerve, okay? That's the idea of pretty much any of the interventions, you know, whether it's steroids, injections, um, anti-inflammatories, those are to get the swelling to come down so that you can start moving, so then that nerve gets more space, so that when it does swell, even just a little bit, it's not being pinched. Yes, ma'am? Does ice help? Yes, ice will help. Rather than heat? Yeah, I, what I tell people about ice versus heat, pay attention to how you feel afterwards. Okay, so if you use heat, because sometimes the nerves are pinched by really tight muscles. So if you feel better after you put a heating pad on, and I mean after, not during, mm -hmm. after, Okay, then probably it's more of a muscular issue or, or a blood flow issue because that's going to increase blood flow too. Okay, if you feel worse, then probably you have an inflammation issue and you should probably use some ice. Okay, so you want to pay attention to how do you feel afterwards. If you feel, um, if you're like me, you can't stand to have ice on anywhere because it hurts, then don't use ice. <laughs> you know? Okay, there's no point in torturing yourself with any of the home stuff. There's no point in torturing yourself because what we have going on is a biofeedback loop. We have information going up to the brain. The brain goes, oh crap, this is dangerous. I'm going to send down repair crews to the area. We have increased inflammation, decreased blood flow. The nerves get pinched, sends information up to the brain, says we're in danger here. The brain says, oh crap, we're in danger. I'm going to send down more <coughs> repair crews. And it keeps going back and forth and back and forth. So, so what we're looking at is trying to interrupt that biofeedback cycle between the brain and the body um, and get things to settle down. Much easier said than done. Thank you. It's a very, very long process. Have you seen all this stuff that I've done to, to make it so I can reverse those? <laughs> no, I haven't seen I've it. I've got this silly cervical You've thing. You told it, it yeah. pump up, right? Uh -huh. And it wasn't helping until this breakthrough that we're talking about here. Uh -huh. So I got blood to that area. Yes. Okay, and like the last two months, I ain't been able, or the last two weeks, I ain't been able to work out, okay? I've just not been feeling up to it. I'm busy. Uh -huh. Guess what? It's back here. I'm getting numb here. I got to get okay. in that thing and start lifting again. Yeah. So what you were proteins. doing was you were getting blood flow to the area, but then you were also moving the muscles and moving the nerves a little uh -huh. and getting more space in there. Okay. I just wish you could have got this all in that 20 minutes, that first 20 minutes I talked to you. <laughs> I know. There's so much information. It's hard to know where, like, where, where do you start and how, what angle do you come in because, you know, we're bumping up against a lot of other topics here too. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so it's kind of hard to piece out, you know, what one topic um, completely. Okay, but so this this gentle nerve glide is pretty much something that you can do at home. You can, if this is too much exercise for, like, if this hurts, you can I've do that. I've been doing that every day for ten years. I was taught that by a physical therapist for a disc I have in my back, a slip disc. Uh huh. They never explained to me what it does. Now I understand why it helps. You see, Lisa, she's such a badass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am a firm believer in I don't do anything unless I understand why. I am one of those really like, yeah, you tell me that I got to do No. You know, so like the Medicare a couple of years ago came and said, okay, anybody who is a fall risk, you have to tell them to see their doctor about getting vitamin D supplements. I heard that, I was on the phone to my boss, why? Yeah. <laughs> why, give me the information, give me the studies that says that right, this is yeah. important. That's why you're so good, because you research. That's why we I, yeah, I research and I, and I kind of I, I, I kind of assume that if other people are not gonna do something unless they understand why. Exactly. Um, and so it, the buy-in is so much more. If you understand, okay, this is why I'm doing this. But not only are you moving that nerve to increase space, you're also moving parts of your, you're in your brain too. You're retraining your brain. On well, the it's one of those things, you know, like, they taught me to do it, it worked, so I just kept doing it. Right. But, you know, a lot of that stuff, if they could tell you to begin with why you're doing it, it would help. Do you switch legs? Yes. You're gonna, you, you want to do both legs. Obviously, if you've got more trouble in one leg, you're going to probably give it a little bit more attention. Well, no, but you know what? That actually brings up a good point. The other half of the squid. There's also times when 
if you've got neuropathy in this foot and it is too hot to handle, it is too much, you cannot move this leg, okay, because it hurts way too bad, you can still do this leg and it will still impact the rest of your body, okay, because these things are connected and so you're going you're gonna to move this side and this side is going to very little, but it's going to be affected as well. Okay, not only that, but there's parts of your brain that are also going to be affected. Even though most of the most of the nerves do cross over, so like if you get a stroke on one half of your brain, it's the other opposite half that you get the, the paralysis. There are about 10% of those neurons that go to the same side. Okay, so you are still working the correct half of the brain a little bit but it's in some way that your brain has said, oh, that's no big deal. She does that all the time, right? Kind of like this. It's no big deal. One of my therapists is over on my right side when I'm telling her it hurts over here. I don't know why you're over there. Yes, yes, yep. All righty. So um, I have a couple of case studies that, um, so Lindsay, I'm gonna give you the, the, the floor for a second. I don't, you can speak from where you are or we can come over here is fine, either way is fine. But Lindsay had a patient who? So she has peripheral neuropathy, so more on hands and feet, but then she also has myelopathy, which is actually basically from the spinal cord, she's lost the myelin sheath, as we talked about the myelin sheath. Mm -hmm. So even along her torso, she has pain and loss of sensation, okay? Um, I worked with her over eight weeks. We did once a week for the first four weeks and twice a week for the um, next four weeks and in about 12 visits we increased her grip strength because I measured her grip strength at the very beginning since it was more neck pain that she was complaining of um, and she had actually improved by about 30 pounds oh, wow. in her grip strength. Now that is not just from doing strengthening exercises because we were hardly doing any strengthening honestly. We were working with blood flow, we were working with doing gentle movements, gentle stretches that nourished and was able to free up those nerves and then she was able to get that strength back in her hands, okay? And she even also said yeah. that she actually was able to regain some sensation along her torso. She had, wow. for the longest time, been numb there. And now we we're getting to the point where someone would touch her and she could feel it, wow. okay? So, and that's just from 12 visits of working on blood flow, understanding what's going on, and getting those nerves to kind of he and that's like I've been testifying since I came to end and I couldn't open my, straighten out my fingers here, especially my middle finger, since she worked on from neck down and my arm and she has, she knows every nerve in my body. So <laughs> I can stretch, I can stretch my hand out, I can grip again and hold. Awesome. Uh, I mean, there is a little pain here and there, but this comes when I cannot see N, when I have to come 14 days later <laughs> or so. So there is, by now, I also, well, I watch, I, I feel her touch, and I do the same uh, stretching exercises here on the nerve, and the muscle, but uh, I am testifying. <laughs> she has healing hands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a and yellow so lab. does Lindsay too. <laughs> and, and the doctor said my chiropractor was like, "You need to stretch," and he goes overboard. Stretch every joint that you have before you get out of bed. Uh huh. Because he says, "What does your dog do after it takes a nap in the afternoon?" And my big lab, that, oh, it would just yeah. stretch and stretch. <laughs> and I, I never told him he was right, but he was. <laughs>